Okay. Well, we're going to go to Judges chapter 17. Judges 17. For this afternoon. We're going to go to Judges 17. And we will just work through this chapter. It's not... A there's some, I think, some interesting things we can see here about that we can hopefully learn from in Judges 17. So we, w we won't read through it entirely, but we'll go through it, we'll work through it verse by verse. So we'll start off with a word of prayer, then we'll start working through it. So Judges chapter 17, so let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I just do thank you, Lord, for this time where once again we can come and study from your word. And as we come to these passages in Judges, Lord God, that are often misunderstood or often underappreciated i do pray you'd help us to learn from these passages help me to teach them and to declare them but also lord that you would help us to not just be hearers of your word but help us be doers of your word and that you would help us to learn the lessons that you want us to learn from this passage so that we don't repeat them and so that we can avoid them lord god and to do what's right and to serve you lord god lord i pray for your help i pray for your blessing and i just ask this in your name Amen. Okay, so Judges 17. Now, just give a brief overview of the book of Judges. Of course, the book of Judges takes place in time period from Joshua up until King Saul. That is the times of the Judges. Now, the thing is, in the Judges period, we see there is what is often referred to as the Judges cycle. Now, the Judges cycle is that God had told Israel, when you go into the land of Canaan, if you will obey me and follow me and keep my commandments, I will bless you, I will protect you, you'll have victory, I'll look after you. But if you don't, I will judge you. And one of the ways God would judge his people is by bringing foreign enemies and problems upon them. And unfortunately, that's what the nation of Israel does. Not long after the time of Joshua and the elders who outlived Joshua, Israel started to go into sin and to idolatry. So they start off, they go into sin, God is then forced to judge them for their sins, usually by sending a foreign power in to oppress them like the Philistines or the Ammonites or who, the Moabites, whoever it may be. Israel then regrets what they've done, cries out unto God, but as you see, as this goes on, it gets less sincere in the book of Judges. It's almost like God's like, hmm... I'm sick and tired of seeing you guys get yourself into trouble and cry unto me and then do it all over again. And he gets re more reluctant, it appears, as he goes along to deliver them instantly. But they repent to some degree. God then sends a judge who is a religious leader and a military leader to help them be freed from their enemies and to lead them into righteousness again. And there's a time of peace. But what happens is that goes on and on and on several times. And the problem is, as Israel goes further into those cycles, it gets worse. And the thing is, though, you may wonder, well, how could Israel, who had been under Moses, gone through the wilderness, been seen God deliver the Canaanites into their hands, broken the backs of their Canaanite enemies, though they did not drive them all out, so they were dominant, but when they were dominant, they did not finish the job, how on earth did they get to this point? How did they get to the point where literally they've gone from bad to worse to terrible? Now, what we see here is in the end of the book of Judges, after you have the stories of Jephthah and, you know, Samson and so on and so forth and Gideon, we see these two particular incidents. You see the incidents of the, Canaan, the Danites going to find a new home. And then you see the story of the Levite and his concubine and the civil war that came about as a result of that against the tribe of Benjamin. But why does God put these in? They're not in chronological order. In fact, these two passages from Judges 17 up until the end of the chapter are in the earlier times of the Judges. So well before Samson, who's the last judge that's mentioned here. Why does God put them in? Well, apparently God puts them in to help explain... How and why Israel became what they were. You see, we've got to realise that from the very earliest days, even in the times of Moses, 
even in the times of Joshua, Israel was still inclined towards doing their own thing. And that's what you see in the book of Judges. What is the chief verse in the book of Judges? It says, there is no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, that's a commentary on the fact that when the book of Judges was written, there was a king. Presumably Samuel wrote Judges during the time of Saul. But there was no king. But remember, Israel did have a king, and their king was meant to be who? God. Now, God would give them a human king, but their king was meant to be the Lord. And they did that which was right in their own eyes. So it gives you the impression that when strong leaders, godly leaders like Moses or Joshua or David were not on the scene to reel them in, guess what Israel did? They went into sin. They went into rebellion. They did their own thing. You even see that later on in the times of the kings, don't you? You'd get bad kings, say, in Judah, who wouldn't just let the people do what they do. Worship idols, do whatever they wanted. You'd get good kings like Jehoshaphat or Hezekiah or Josiah, who would do what? They'd reel the people back in. they tried to make reforms. they tried to set people on the straight and narrow. But when there was no godly leader, or strong godly leader, like Moses or Joshua or David or the kings later on, what would Israel do? They'd go into sin. And this is what we see very early in the book of Judges. So these passages from Judges 17 on to the end of the book, they take place roughly between Judges chapter 1 to 3. So it's at, at the beginning of the book you could put them, chronologically. And they help to explain how and why Israel became what they were. And how religious and moral chaos arose and how they go together. Because you're going to see in this passage here that Israel, even very early on, not all of them, but you can see this inclination amongst the tribes of Israel towards religious rebellion and chaos and then moral re rebellion and chaos. And this is what you see here. So it gets worse as time goes on. And I believe it's a commentary on how Israel got to the point that it did later on. In other words, the principle was when the cats were away, the mice would play. But not realising that God was there watching them. See, when the cat was there, they behaved themselves. But when the cat was gone, they did what they wanted. And that's unfortunately repeated time and time and time again with the nation of Israel. And so, what do we see here? How does this verse show the religious and moral chaos that was rising in Israel? Well, notice here, so verse 1, it says, and There was a man of Mount Ephraim. So Ephraim is in central Israel, in the hill countries. So in Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. So this is a Jewish man. So this isn't a pagan, this isn't a Canaanite, this isn't an Amorite, this isn't a foreigner. This is a Jewish man called Micah. So what did Micah do? Now, as you go through this, you actually see that there's many different people. There's the tribe of Ephraim is represented. There's the tribe of uh, the Levites are represented, there's the tribe of Dan represented, and then later on the tribe of Benjamin are represented. That's four out of twelve tribes. So that shows you that this religious and moral rebellion and chaos that ensued was widespread. And it was widespread. And even Joshua had warned them at the end of his life, you're going to go your own way. I see it in your eyes. As soon as I'm gone, you're going to do your own thing. Moses even told them that, and that's unfortunately what happened. But here's Micah. Presumably he was an Ephraimite from the tribe of Ephraim. He lived in the land of Ephraim, in Mount Ephraim. And it says, and he said unto his mother, so it sort of just jumped straight into the story. So Micah goes to his mum and says to his mum this, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from me about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me, I took it. So just jump straight in. Micah, this Ephraimite, goes to his mum and says, You know, mum, 
Remember the incident when 1,100 shekels of silver were stolen? Yeah, I'm, I'm still furious over that, and I curse, I cursed whoever it was who did that. So Micah's going in and saying, well, Mum, I took that silver. 1,100 shekels, that's an awful lot of money. In fact, if you consider later on in the passage, in verse 10, the Levite who goes to work for Micah, he is happy with... 10 shekels of silver a year. Micah stole over 1,000 shekels from his own mum. Now, it's, now, let me say, it's bad to steal from anyone, stranger. But isn't it terrible when a child steals from their own parents? And imagine that huge sum, 1,100 shekels. Now, obviously, this implies that Micah's family were very well to do. You know, to have 1,100 shekels and apparently it didn't bankrupt them, but it was a hit. So he says, uh, Mum, you know you cursed the person who took those? Which was common in those days. You could, make, you could write out a curse and say, I curse so-and-so with this or that. May the gods do this or that, blah, 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 blah. They find them all over the ancient world. They have curse tablets. Literally, they'd inscribe in lead or other things to curses upon a person or a family. and Find them all the time. Apparently, maybe something like that happened. We do not know. But his mum cursed the thief. Little realising that the thief was her own son. And so, apparently, Micah doesn't feel bad for stealing the money. He's worried because his mum did what? Put a curse on him. That, that shows, you know, even how superstitious they were at that point. He's not worried about stealing the first sum of money. No, no. Which he obviously hadn't used. So maybe it didn't happen long after. Like, he stole it, his mum cursed the person, and he's like, Oh no, the curse is going to come upon me. And, I, and, you know, superstitiously being afraid. Now, was this a godly curse? I don't think so, given what his mum does next. But he's not repentant about stealing the money. He's only repentant because he's worried about his own hide. So the first character you meet took a couple of sentences in and he's already realised he's a moral, uh, mo morally and religiously dubious. A thieving son. He says, and spakest of also in mine ears. So his mum told him he, she had done this. And that was probably what made him think, oh, I've got to give this back. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. So he confesses. Not because I believe he felt bad about stealing the money. I think he was just worried about what would happen to him from a curse. So obviously he was ungodly. And things only go from bad to worse. So you're hardly into the story and you start to realise here's a Jew who knew he shouldn't have stolen and is obviously superstitious and he hasn't honoured his mum but yet he's obviously only concerned for himself. And this is an, um, obviously a quite important man in the area as we're going to see because he sets up a place of false worship in his house. So apparently important and wealthy. And so if the rich were doing that in Israel, what was everyone else doing who were probably following them? You see the problem here. So very early on, there was big issues morally and spiritually with the Israelites. When the mice were away, when the cats were away, the mice would play. He says, so he admits it. And his mother says, and his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. So, his son, her son has just admitted he stole a small fortune and he's implied that the only reason he's given it back and confessed is because he was afraid of the curse, not for doing wrong. And his mum says, oh, oh, I'm relieved. I'm glad you stole it and it wasn't some stranger. Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. You would think the mum would say, I, I should kill you. What would you do if your child came up to you and stole a small fortune and said, Oh, I did it. Would you say, Oh, blessed be the, and blessed be thou of the Lord, my son or daughter. See, there's no discipline. There's no rebuke. 
It's not, you did wrong, Micah. Oh, I'm just happy I got the money back and it was you who stole it. Whoa, 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 whoa. So, you're more bothered about the money than the fact that your son is a superstitious thief. You see the issues here. This is what we see. From the very earliest point of this story, we see the son is, in, in, is corrupt, his mum is corrupt, and it only goes from bad to worse to terrible. And that's the problem. You see, in society, societies, wherever they are in the world, are based upon what? Families. And if the family unit is corrupt, guess what? That's going to result in local government will be corrupt. Religious institutions will be corrupt. Governments, larger, will be corrupt. You see, because nations are made of families. If the children are corrupt, that, that will lead to problems. And oftentimes I ask the question, well, if the child has turned out wrong, why did they turn out wrong? Well, maybe his mum didn't teach him, or she just didn't care. We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us all the details, but we see the issue. Two very dubious people, and we're only a verse in. And it gets worse. No discipline, no rebuke. She's just happy she, her son stole the money so she can now get it back. So he obviously hadn't spent any of it. He was so scared. Verse 3. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, so he hadn't spent any, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son. So in other words, she then reveals why she had that sum of money. And she says, the reason why I had it done was because I was going to give that money and dedicate all of it. Notice she says all of it, the 1,100, 1100 shekels of silver, to who? To God. to God. So she had promised to give that money to the Lord. So, yeah, that sounds good. You know, you're, you've basically given a love offering or a gift to the Lord. So, and that should be a good thing, right? Well, until you realise what was going to happen with that. He says, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand to, for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So apparently, the money was set aside for God. She then tells the son who stole it, I was going to give that money to you because I had dedicated the money to the Lord and I was going to make a graven image. So in other words, she was going to make an idol so they'd carve out of wood and overlay it with silver and a molten image. So pre presumably a little molten figure, you know. And I wanted you to do that, son. So, yeah, it sounds good that she's dedicated the money, but now it's very clear what is she doing with the money. She's committing idolatry. And yet she's saying she's doing it in the name of who? Lord. Lord, exactly. You see the issue here. In other words, like mother, like son. This was a re obviously a religious family, but a morally wicked family. They saw no issue with idolatry in God's name. And see, that was always the issue with Israel. Israel always tried to have their cake and eat it. They tried to have idolatry and they tried to have God at the same time. That's what Elijah calls them out for on Mount Carmel, doesn't he? He says, choose you this day who you serve, Baal or the other gods or the Lord. But see, what were they trying to do? They were trying to do both. They were synergy. They were trying to be synchronistic. They were trying to mish, mash paganism in with the worship of God. That was always their major problem in the Old Testament. But these, this family obviously saw no issue with that, as we're going to see. And so, in other words, if, they, if it seemed and felt right to them, and others, they did it. See, the son doesn't object, the mum doesn't object, later on, the Danites don't object, the Levite doesn't object, because they all are tacitly are implying that it's all right. It's all right. We're worshipping God, but we're having our idols too. As long as we worship the Lord, that's all that matters, isn't it? We're all worshipping the same God, right? And see, this is the problem. It's utter confusion. 
it's confused and you can go through it and it's like how did it get to this point and this is very early in the times of the judges so no wonder later on it gets bad because this generation is going to lead to the next generation and generally what you or I do in moderation the next generation will do to excess and that's why it tends to get worse. It's like snowball. It comes, starts off sn st top of, uh, small at the top of the hill, but as it goes down, it gathers more, gets bigger and more destructive. So anyway, she dedicated this money to the Lord, but was yet going to use it for idolatry. And then, verse 4, Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. Now, what did the mother say previously? I had dedicated all of this money towards making a graven image and a molten image. But then verse 4 clearly states how much that money did she use to make those images? 200. Where is the other 900? Where is the other 900? She said she had dedicated all that towards making images. Now, which is what? Because, of course, the Bible says you should not make any graven images. But now you have to wonder, well, how comes her son turned out to be a thief? Because apparently the mother was a thief too. She had said, I'll give all of this wholly dedicated to the Lord. 1,100, she only gives two. Where's the 900 she had promised? So she's not just religiously, uh, uh, religiously uh, corrupt, she is also morally corrupt. Where is the other 900? So apparently, as I said, like mother, like son, you know, at the end of the day, apparently the thievery was running in the family. So you also see hypocrisy, don't you? She cursed the son for stealing the money, but yet she had promised the money to God, but yet didn't give all the money to God. You see the issues here. And this is just one family in Ephraim. That's the point here. And that's why we wonder, well, how come society has gotten to get to the point it does? It all starts off at ground level and works up. That's how it works. That's why it's important, you know, if you have a family or ever want a family, to have to raise, to, you live in such a way that your kids can see is consistent and godly and raise your kids to be the same. Now, no one's going to be 100% consistent all of the time, but, you know, people make mistakes. But the fact is, the goal should be to, to live a consistent life so that others see the consistent life and then teach them to live the consistently. But the only thing we can see with Mike and his mum that is consistent is that they're both morally and religiously wicked. You know, and that's one family in Ephraim. You see the point here. It started off at the bottom. His mother influenced him, whether she probably realised it or not, yet no one but God seemed to be bothered or concerned. No one seemed to be bothered. And this is the thing. Mike doesn't seem bothered. His mum doesn't seem bothered. The Levite who we're going to see doesn't seem bothered. The tribe of Dan doesn't seem bothered. No one seems bothered. Only when it's sort of inconveniences them. The one person you don't really hear is God. And he's only brought up in a sort of, a, oh yeah, well, you know, God's up there. But let's not bring him down here and to deal with this. See, this is why the Bible says that in the, in the verses, like, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And when man does that which is right in his own eyes, it will lead to chaos eventually. And it will go from bad to worse to terrible. So, what we see in verse 5, it says, And the man Micah had a house of gods. So notice here. So Micah, obviously, in, probably in the property, wherever, he already had a house of gods. Now, we don't, when you think of gods, don't necessarily think of big, huge statues. In fact, the Bible says here he had a house of gods. So obviously, they worship more than one god. And made an ephod. What's an ephod? Do you remember the, in the Old Testament, the, the high priest would wear the ephod and would have the stones on it? 
that's it, sort of like a special breastplate. Well, probably that stem taken what they've seen at the tabernacle and the priests wear and, and saying, oh, well, if we have a place of worship for our gods, then we want that same thing too. So taking the things of God and using them for wicked means. Remember, Gideon did the same thing, didn't he? He made an ephod. Why? Even the judges were doing dumb things like that when they were told not to. And teraphim. Now, what's teraphim? Teraphim is just a Hebrew word that means small images. So you wouldn't necessarily, like, you could have an, a house for your gods, but don't always think these massive statues. They could be just small images, teraphim. In fact, remember earlier with Jacob? And Jacob, um, when Rachel stole the, the images from Laban, those are teraphim. And so they would, you know, put them in a place in the niche and, you know, they would worship them. So obviously Micah had a house of gods. These were just another two images to add in. He made an ephod and teraphim. So he had multiple gods and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So, like, it just shows the absolute religious chaos. His mum with her lips is saying they're serving the Lord, but yet with her actions is showing she's not. Her own son has a house of false gods. He's made one of his sons a priest, which was not allowed. He's, he's set up many gods, has an image. And when considering all this, not very far away from Mount Ephraim was actually the true place of worship, the tabernacle. They wouldn't have been far away. This is full-blown false worship. And what you're going to see is, you know, you say, well, people may say, oh, well, his family were just doing what they were doing. It was, uh, who was it hurting? Well, it was hurting other people because when you see the Danites come along later on and take all, this, all these goodies, which is what they do, what happens is the people of the area come out and try to stop them. So guess what? They were using Micah's house as a false place of worship. And you see that later on in chapter 18. They're not happy that the Danites are actually doing this. Stealing their stuff. It says, it says in, actually in chapter 18 verse 22, just to show you this. It says, and when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? And he said, Ye have taken away my gods which I made, and the priest, and ye have gone away. And what have I more? And what is this that ye say unto me, What aileth thee? So in other words, the men of the area, the people there were going to Micah's house to worship. It was like a, a temple. And this was the nation of Israel doing this in one of the larger tribes. And they were worshipping in such a way. Now notice here, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. So that's a, that's a political, practical statement. There was no king. Physically there was no king to rein them in. To rein them in from their excesses. To rein them in from their wrongdoings like Hezekiah, Josiah, or Jehoshaphat or David. But even then the kings didn't always succeed in that and sometimes the kings went along with that. But they did have a king, their king was meant to be the Lord. In those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You see rejection of godly culture and God's word leads to the times of the judges. And this is what you see in our age, isn't it? Oh, well, if I feel like today I'm a woman, I am a woman. And, you know, people are actually fawning over people like that and saying, Oh, yeah, you are. No, you're not. Well, what if t tomorrow you change? You see, this is the world we live in. Well, I feel this. I feel that. I, if I think that's right, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. No, the truth is the truth whether you like it or not. You know, but this is the world we live in. 
doesn't mean everybody thinks that way, you know. But the fact is, when you start seeing this sort of moral and, and family chaos and religious chaos going on, it only gets worse. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be pulled back or it can't be curbed or it can't be reeled in. But the problem is, once the ball starts rolling, it sometimes is very hard to stop it. The people get a taste for it. And we are living in a similar sort of time. Like I said, well, I can be whatever I want to be. If I want to be this, I want to be that. If I think it's right, that's all that matters. But what about God? What about biology? What about the truth? What about re the common sense and reality? You know? So... I believe we're living in a similar sort of period, except they probably wouldn't have gone to some of the weirdness that we do today. But anyway, so this one family shows you things were very wrong within Israel, even early on. But verse 7 says, And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. So next we see, we see this immoral family... But next we see a self-seeking Levite. Now remember, the Levites were, were meant to be the priestly tribe, weren't they? Now, just because you were a Levite didn't necessarily mean you were the could be a priest. You know, to be the high priest, you had to be from the sons of Aaron, you know. But the fact of the matter is, we see here is a Levite. Now the Bible says that he was a young Levite and he was out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, that's interesting because if you read Numbers and Joshua, you realise that the Levites, as a tribe, did not receive land in the land of Israel. They received cities with a parcel of land around it. No big, you know, area. They were to be a scattered tribe within Israel. And they were meant to stay in those cities and live in them as Levites. But notice, where was this Levite? Was he in one of the Levitical cities? No, he was in Bethlehem, Judah. That was not a Levitical city. But yeah, why was he living there? When God had said the Levites should be living in their inheritance, in their cities. So even near, the Levite is not where he ought to be. Who was a Levite and he sojourned there. So he had obviously moved from wherever he came from, went to Bethlehem, Judah, and for whatever reason decided, oh, I'm just going to move on. What was he doing there? God already had a place for him. But yet, why was he there? You couldn't get more clear. You are a Levite. This is the city you live in. If you stay there and be faithful, I will bless you. What was he doing in Bethlehem? And we see that he obviously wasn't happy in Bethlehem because what does he do? He moves on somewhere else. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Ju Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. In other words, for some reason, he had left his original home, apparently, in one of the Levitical cities. He had gone to Bethlehem, apparently wasn't happy, and he decides he wants to move again. Why? We don't know. Maybe he thought he could get a better place somewhere else, get better opportunities. Now, is there anything necessarily wrong with, you know, moving? No. Isn't necessarily anything we're looking for a better job or a better this or a better that. No. But the thing is here, this Levite, as you can tell, would obviously, was obviously a self-server. Why? Because he went where he could find a place. In other words, he wasn't interested in where God wanted him to be, doing where God wanted him to do. He wanted to be where he wanted to be, doing what he wanted to do. And as you're going to see... He's got no scruples. As you're going to see, it will get worse. So, the thing is here, God isn't saying moving is bad or seeking opportunities is bad. But if God has said, I want you here doing this, and you decide, no, I'm going to go here and do that because I want to do that, that is a problem. Now, if God says go, and God says do, fine, nothing wrong. But this is the problem. He shouldn't have been doing that. He was just following his own desires, not what God wanted. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. 
So he wanted more than God wanted him to have. He wasn't content with such things as he had. He wanted more. Now, like I said, is there anything wrong with bettering yourself? No. But to better yourself outside of God's will, that's the problem. That's the problem. And realize, people say, but if I stay here or I do this, I'm never going to get anywhere. I'm never going to have anything. But look, if God wants you here doing this, then do you think you could, God can do a better job of bettering you where you're at doing what he wants? Do you think he can do that? Now sometimes, you know, it doesn't make, always make sense, does it, humanly speaking. Well, God, if I stay here and I keep doing this, it appears to me nothing would change. Well, but if God says stay put and do this, then do you think God can make more of where, of where you're at than rebelling against him. The fact of the matter is, he should have stayed put, but he didn't. See, God can better you better than you can. But, for him to do that, you have to be where he wants you to be, doing what he wants you to do. The Levite wasn't doing that, and that's the issue. Verse 9, And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And so obviously the Ephraimite, he's going through Mount Ephraim to the north. So he travels north from Bethlehem, Judah, into the lands of Ephraim. And he comes across the house of Micah. And Micah said, look, who are you? Where did you come from? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. And I go to sojourn where I may, fi where I may find a place. You see, he even says... He's not saying, I'm going where God wants me to go. I'm just going where I want to go and where I think is best and what I want to do. And I, 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 I. You see, everyone in this incident is doing what suits them. If it suits them to steal and then give it back, they do it. If it suits them to make a promise and don't keep it, they do it. If it suits them to make a house of idols, then they do it. If it suits them to move, they do it. If it suits them to do whatever they want to do, they do it. You see... And, and they will change their plans when it suits them. So as we're going to see, the Levite will be happy for a time. But when it suits them to, to pack up sticks and go elsewhere, they do it. You see, God isn't even in the picture. No, it's God isn't even mentioned. He's only mentioned in person in a sort of a religious, superstitious -y sort of way. So he's nowhere in their minds. Even the priestly tribe, one of their people isn't even interested in what God thinks or feels, which is a terrible condemnation on the nation. And Micah said unto him, dwell with me and be unto me a fervor and a priest. So Micah said, oh, oh, you're a priest, you're a Levite, you're from the Levitical tribe. Well, look, I've got a deal for you. Why don't you be my priest? We have this nice little house of gods. Well, you know, if you're a Levite, a good Levite, you'd be like, whoa, whoa, no, no, that's idolatry, man. I'm out of here, bye. He doesn't. He says, in fact, I have a son who's a priest, but you'd make a better priest because you're a Levite. Ooh, why don't you come and work for me? And he says, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year. So remember, Micah stole over 1,000. The priest was happy with ten a year. And a suit of apparel, so you'll get a change of good clothes every year. And your victuals. So in other words, you get... This amount of money, a suit, a nice suit of clothes, change of clothes, and you get your bed and board. It's not too bad, really. Micah is happy with that. So the, so the Levite went in. So that was obviously, at the time, a good deal. Because if it wasn't, do you think he would have stayed put? No. Exactly. This is the thing. See, Micah's son was good enough until a real priest came along. So in other words, they're just doing whatever suits them. Ah yes, son, you're a good priest, but now this guy's come, I think he needs to be a priest now. They're just changing on a whim. And in fact, the Levites sold out God and do him right for a decent wage. But what would have God have given him if he just did right? So wow, I'm willing to compromise, I'm willing to rebel, and I'm willing to serve in the house of gods, even though he shouldn't have been a priest, by the way. Even though he was a Levite, he couldn't be a priest. He was willing to sell out for God for ten pieces of silver, 
bed and board and one change of clothes in a year. You know? So obviously, he thought that was a good deal. But yet, what would have happened maybe if God, he had just done what was right? Verse 11. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man. So, it doesn't sound like a lot to us. Bed and board, ten shekels of silver and a change of clothes. But obviously, the Levite thought it was a good deal. He wouldn't have stayed if he didn't think it was. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. So, in fact... What makes this worse is later on when Micah is sold out by the Levite is Micah treated him like one of his own, like one of his family. But yet, when a new opportunity comes along, he sells out his, his, his uh, you could say his adopted family and just goes off somewhere else because it suits him. With a son, with an adopter, you could say, well, I know he wasn't adopted, but with, you know, with friends like that, who needs enemies? He was content for now, which shows you something. You have to be very careful of someone who's just willing to go where the wind blows and wherever things look and sound better. Because someone like that has no loyalty. They have no loyalty. Think about it. Have you ever met someone who may hang around you for a while because they think, well, yeah, the going is good here for the moment. But when they hear it's the going is good some, but good or somewhere else, sorry, they're off. This is what the Levite was like. And if a man will betray God, which is what the Levite did, by becoming a priest in the house of idols, selling himself out to the highest bidder, he will betray you too. And that's what you see later on. He's willing to betray whoever... He doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you made a contract. It doesn't matter if you were friends with this guy. It doesn't matter if you were close. He just went wherever it suited him. Verse 12... And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. So, he becomes a priest. Now, like I mentioned, in Exodus and in Numbers and Vickers, it's very clear that the Levites, though they were a priestly tribe, they were not all priests. The high priest, which is presumably what Micah was wanting him to do the job of, was only for the sons of Aaron. But this was just a normal Levite who would have, at best, ministered in the tabernacle. You know, helping out with the services, helping out with the offerings, helping out with the sacrifices. But now he was doing a job that he was not meant to be doing. Because he was not one of the sons of Aaron. And so what you see here is that this goes from bad to worse to terrible. And this is one of the priestly tribe doing this. Verse 13. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. So the voice he says, Wow, now I know God's going to bless me, because I've got this rebellious Levite serving in a house of idols, and now he's my personal priest and then priest to the neighborhood. I know God's going to be happy now. Think about that. He really seems to think that the Lord will be happy with him. And he has a house of idols. He has an on-the-run Levite, who's who's basically a sellsword, and putting his services out to the highest bidder. And he's made this guy a priest when he shouldn't be a priest at all. And he thinks God's going to be happy. But I think he thought that. Because why? Because everyone was doing that which was right in his own eyes. Who cares what God thinks? I think it's right. That's all that matters. And the problem is you see it today in Christianity, don't you? That sort of attitude. Well, I don't, Well, yeah, that's what the Bible says. But I feel that this is right. And if others are doing this as well, well, why shouldn't I do it too? No, no. It's not what you feel that's, is what, what you feel is whether it is right or wrong. No, because the Bible says our hearts are deceitful. They can lie to you. We may think something is right, but what if the word of God says it's wrong? And just because everyone else is doing something, no, it's here. Micah is doing wrong. His mum is doing wrong. The neighbours are doing wrong. The Levite is doing wrong. The tribe of Dan is doing wrong. But yet no one seems to be bothered about what God thinks. So who was in the majority here? The godly 
or the ungodly. The ungodly. And it just shows. And so we need to be really careful because, you know, even as a world at large, yes, this seems to be how it is. We are getting, like, you know, and doesn't mean that fe- people haven't fought in similar ways in the past, but the fact is, at the moment, every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. But as Christians, should we be doing that which is right in our own eyes? No. Micah shouldn't have been. He should have been a good son honouring his mother and honouring God. His mother should have given Micah a good example by honouring God and keeping her promises and not encouraging idolatry in her house. And the Levite should have been encouraging and doing right by staying where he should have been, doing what God wanted him to do, being happy with what he had, and not doing a job that God didn't want him to do in a wicked place. But yet, they're all doing it. And then you see the entire tribe is willing to do it. And so we have to be very careful. Just because everyone around us seems to be doing something and it may feel good or look good and everyone else is doing it, does that mean it's right? Uh Uh-uh. Because God basically shows that the result of all of this is chaos. And to cut the long story short, as a result of what Micah has done, it would eventually lead to an infamous, uh, uh, infamous... place of false worship being set up in the tribe of Dan, in the city of Dan, which would lead multitudes into idolatry. All because one man stole some money, his mum thought a good idea to make false images, and a Levite decided he wasn't happy with what God wanted him to do. You see the problem there? Little things can quickly become big things if you do wrong. So we need to learn from this. God wants us to learn so that from this incident so that we don't repeat the same mistakes they did. It's a good example of what we shouldn't do. And so, Lord willing, next time we'll maybe go next time I'm here we'll go on to chapter eighteen and see how things go from bad to worse, with an entire tribe going the way of the world. So let's end there, have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity we've had to study it. And Lord, help us to learn from, the, from, from these incidents with Micah and his mum and the Levite, Lord. Help us not to be like them, Lord. Lord, we make mistakes. Lord, we may blow it and fail at times, mentally or physically or spiritually. But Lord, help us not to be like them, to understand that we have a ruler and that's you and you ta- and you have told us what to do and not to do help us to follow you help us lord god not to lord god do that which is right in our own eyes but help us to do that which is right in your eyes lord lord you could have blessed micah and his mum and the levite lord god if they just had followed you but they didn't and it led to bad places not just for them but for others for many generations after And I pray you'd help us to learn from this, to apply these things to our life, and Lord God, to be on guard, Lord God, because we need your help, Lord. And I thank you for this time. I pray you just bless us as we pray it wise, and that you'd um, just bless the rest of our day. And I ask these things in your name. Amen.